The Red Viper Oberyn Martell and Gregor Clegane, The Mountain That Rides, don't just go to war in an epic and painful to read battle to determine Tyrion's fate. Hidden in the text of their battle, these present day warriors are pantomiming the lore and legends surrounding the Long Night's cause. And understanding this pantomime is key to fully enjoying Martin Storm of Swords masterpiece. <laughs> Sir Stefan here. This is part two of our look at Lucifer Means Lightbringer's basic A Song of Ice and Fire theory. Links to my part one video and links to LML as he is known are in the description. Last time I promised a cool Tyrion Long Night reveal, and it's coming, but first let's set the stage. From A Storm of Swords Tyrion, we meet our sun and moon and find their fate. Oberyn Martell War, quote, a high golden helm with a copper disc mounted on the brow, the son of Dorn. His round steel shield was brightly polished, and showed the sun and spear in red gold, yellow gold, white gold, and copper. Gregor Clegane, the mountain, he wore, quote, dull gray steel, dented and scarred. The crest atop his helm was a stone fist. And recall from part one that Bonero tells us a fist represents a moon. Now it's time for the reading. Don't worry, I'm not going to do the whole chapter or even half. From Storm of Swords, the reading. There were 50 yards between them. Prince Oberyn advanced quickly. Sir Gregor more ominously. The ground does not shake when he walks, Tyrion told himself. That is only my heart fluttering. When the two men were ten yards apart, the Red Viper stopped and called out. Have they told you who I am? Sir Gregor grunted through his breast. Some dead man. He came on inexorably. The doorsman slid sideways. I am Oberyn Martell, a prince of Dorne, he said, as the mountain turned to keep him in sight. Prince Elia was my sister. Who? asked Gregor Clegane. Oberyn's long spear jabbed, but Sir Gregor took the point on his shield, shoved it aside, and pulled back at the prince. And bulled back at the prince, his great sword flashing. You raped her, you murdered her, you killed her children. Gregor tried to bull rush, but Oberyn skipped aside and circled around his back. The stable was behind him. Spectators screamed and shoved at each other to get out of the way. One stumbled into Oberyn's back. Sir Gregor hacked down with all of his savage strength. The Red Viper threw himself sideways, rolling. The luckless stable boy behind him was not so quick. His arm rose to protect his face. Gregor's sword took it off below the elbow and shoulder. Between the elbow and shoulder. Shut up! The mountain howled at the stable boy's scream, and this time he swung the blade sideways sending half of the lad's head across the yard in a spray of blood and brains. I will hear you say it. She was Elia of Dorne. The mountain snorted contemptuously and came on. And in that moment, the sun broke through the low clouds that had hidden the sky since dawn. The son of Dorne, Tyrion told himself. But it was Gregor Clegane who moved first to put the sun at his back. This is a dim and brutal man, but he has a warrior's instincts. The Red Viper crouched, squinting, and sent his spear darting forward again. Sir Gregor hacked at it, but the thrust had only been a feint. Off balance, he stumbled forward a step. Prince Oberyn tilted his dented metal shield. A shaft of sunlight blazed blindingly off polished gold and copper into the narrow slit of his foe's helm. Clegane lifted his own shield against the glare. Prince Oberyn's spear flashed like lightning and found the gap in the heavy plate, the joint under the arm. The point punched through mail and boiled leather. Gregor gave a choked grunt as the Dornishman twisted his spear and yanked it free. Elia. Say it, Elia of Dorn. He was circling, spear poised for another thrust. Say it. Tyrion had his own prayer. Fall down and die. Fall down and die was how it went. 
damn you, fall down and die. The blood trickling from the mountain's armpit was his own now, and he must be bleeding more heavily inside the breastplate. When he tried to take a step, one knee buckled. Tyrion thought he was going down. Prince Oberyn had circled behind him. Eli of Dorne, he shouted. Sir Gregor started to turn, but too slow and too late. The spearhead went through the back of the knee this time, through the layers of chain and leather, between the plates on thigh and calf. The mountain reeled, swayed, then collapsed face first on the ground. His huge sword went flying from his hand. Slowly, ponderously, he rolled onto his back. The Dornishman flung away his ruined shield, grasped the spear in both hands, and sauntered away. Behind him, the mountain let out a groan and pushed himself onto an elbow. Oberyn whirled cat quick and ran at his fallen foe. Elia! he screamed as he drove the spear down with the whole weight of his body behind it. The crack of the ashwood shaft snapping was almost as sweet a sound as Cersei's well of fury. And for an instant, Prince Oberyn had wings. The snake has vaulted over the mountain. Four feet of broken spear jutted from Clegane's belly as Prince Oberyn rolled, rose, and dusted himself off. He tossed aside the splintered spear and claimed his foe's greatsword. If you die before you say her name, sir, I will hunt you through all seven hells, he promised. Sir Gregor tried to rise. The broken spear had gone through him and was pinning him to the ground. He wrapped both hands about the shaft, grunting, but could not pull it out. Beneath him was spreading a pool of red. I am feeling more innocent by the instant, Tyrion told Elarius Sand beside him. Prince Oberyn moved closer. Say the name. He put a foot on the mountain's chest and raised the greatsword with both hands. Whether he intended to hack off Gregor's head or shove the point through his eye slit was something Tyrion would never know. Clegane's hand shot up and grabbed the Dornishman between the knee. Grabbed the Dornishman behind the knee. The Red Viper brought down the greatsword in a wild slash, but he was off balance, and the edge did no more than put a dent in the mountain's vambrace. Then the sword was forgotten as Gregor's hand tightened and twisted, yanking the Dornishman down on top of him. They wrestled in the dust and blood. The broken spear wobbled back and forth. Tyrion saw with horror that the mountain had wrapped one huge arm around the prince, drawing him tight against his chest like a lover. Elia of Dorn, they had all heard Sir Gregor say when they were close enough to kiss. His deep voice boomed within the helm, I killed her screaming whelp. He thrust his free hand into Oberyn's unprotected face, pushing steel fingers into his eyes. Then I raped her. Clegane slammed his fist into the Dornishman's mouth, making splinters of his teeth. Then I smashed her head in like this. He drew back his huge fist. The blood on his gauntlets seemed to smoke in the cold dawn air. There was a sickening crunch. Arlaria Sand wailed in terror, and Tyrion's breakfast came boiling back up. He found himself on his knees, retching bacon and sausage and apple cakes, and that double helping of fried eggs cooked up with onions and fiery Dornish peppers. He was halfway down the serpentine steps before he realized that the gold cloaks were not taking him back to his tower room. I've been consigned to the black cells, he said. They did not bother to answer. Why waste your breath on the dead? Summary. The Azora High Fable that describes the sun stabbing the moon. The Quarthine Second Moon Fable that describes the meteorites that fall from the second moon's destruction. Benero pantomiming the destruction of the second moon. The splitting of the comet pantomimed in the breaking of ice. The sun, moon, comet, long night pantomime performed by the mountain and the viper. One is skeptical still. It's not the fault of LML or his theories. 
Any lack of your belief lies with me and my simple, limited interpretations of these theories. Please visit LML's links below. I implore you. This has been number 85, part 2 of the Holy Hundred. Here's a sneak peek at number 84. Let's get ready to rumble!